Hello and welcome to week four here at TU in astronomy course. This is going to be chapter seven and eight. We'll start off with chapter seven on other worlds and introduction to the solar system. So here's a self-portrait of Mars from the Curiosity rover that NASA landed in 2012. Oddly enough, one of my former high school interns is the one that actually lands these rovers on Mars when we land them. Uh, she works out at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and went to high school here in Springfield, Missouri. So, pretty neat connection to me. She was my uh, intern when she was in high school and I was in uh, college. Of course, we've been to the moon with the astronauts. We've got Apollo 15 here. Uh, one of the vacation of work from Dave Scott, NASA. We can see the flag there, and actually that flag, uh, you know, there's less gravity on the moon, but how's that flag sticking straight out? Well, they put wires in it so that it would stand straight out. They curled it up and put it on the moon. Now, the planets orbit generally in a slight elliptical orbit. Um, it's only these weird... Uh, Plutonic type of objects like Pluto, Aries, Makemake, that are really out of the plane of the solar system. And we call these right now dwarf planets. The surface of Mercury is Pop March with craters on it. It was seen by the Mariner 10 spacecraft and then more recently by another spacecraft. Our four giant planets, you can see comparison to Earth is Jupiter, Saturn, and then the icy giants, Uranus, and Neptune. Neptune actually has the fastest winds of any object in the solar system. And then we have our Pluto flyby that we did in July of 2015. Dr. Alan Stern, a friend of mine, was the lead principal investigator of this mission. And we found Pluto to be very highly geologically active, much more so than we ever thought it would be. Siren and its rings, we recently wrapped up a 20-year mission to Siren. This image is from 2007. Cassini is the spacecraft that flew by Saturn and flew around it many times. Went through its rings and ended its mission by slamming into the atmosphere of Saturn so it would not uh, contaminate other worlds because it had radioactivity on it and radioactive isotopes on it to power it. Here's the asteroid Eros, a small Earth crossing asteroid taken by the NEAR spacecraft. So it's for near Earth asteroid recovery. The Shoemaker spacecraft from about 100 kilometers out. I'm not even going to try to pronounce this, this comet's name. You can read it there, 67P. This comet was noted in the 2015 era from the Rosetta spacecraft. We can see jets of activity on its surface shooting out out in space. And then here are two of my heroes. Carl Sagan, who died in 1996 and ran the original PBS show Cosmos. And then on the right, Neil deGrasse Tyson Sagan was Tyson's inspiration to become an astrophysicist. And I have met uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson back in January of 2010. Great guy, but he is so busy these days, and we're going to do a reboot of the reboot of Cosmos. We rebooted Cosmos a few years ago on Fox and Discovery Network, and they're going to do it again in 2019 when they get some more episodes taped. We're going to counteract the fake news and fake facts with actual science and actual facts, I say. 
Here is Jupiter taken by the Cassini spacecraft way back in 2000 as it was on its way to Saturn. Test out its cameras. One of Jupiter's moons is Ganymede. It was taken in 1996 by the Galileo spacecraft, which was seen to go around Jupiter many times. It was similar in mission to the Cassini mission in later years. And the bright spots are recent impacts with uncovered fresh ice from underneath. One of the most fascinating missions that I've ever been a part of, and maybe everybody else in my field has been a part of, was Comet Shoemaker Levy 9. In this image, we have a comet that was too close to Jupiter and it broke it apart into a string of pearls, they called it. 21 separate pieces. This image taken in 1994 by the Hubble Space Telescope. You can see I'm starting to date myself now. I was a junior in college um, studying this thing. This is before students had email access, really. My email was, was restricted to government computers um, because I was working for NASA at the time. On NASA funding, I had access to email, and um, we had great big printers that would print off the um, data each day of the stuff. And this ended up impacting Jupiter. And so we have these dark blotches where the impacts went in and exploded. And the biggest is the G impact right here. And that circle there is three times the size of the Earth. This work was done with the Hubble Space Telescope from my friend Heidi Hamill. Um, she was at MIT at the time, I believe, uh, if my memory serves me right. Uh, wonderful woman, wonderful friend, and a colleague. And then we have our crared moon. This is a composite image taken from many small images from 2009 to 2011 by the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. So this shows radioactive decay. Radioactive decay just basically says that something that's radioactive over time has a number of half-lives, which means that uh, if you double the time it's been around, it's going to have one-fourth of the radioactivity that we expect. If we divide it by three, it's going to have one-eighth the radioactivity. And you can see going down and down and down, it just goes half and half and half and half away. The solar nebula is an artist's conception, it's not real. It is what we believe the solar system formed out of, a flattened cloud of gas and dust is what planetary system formed. Icy and rocky planetesimals collided and merged together to form the planets and the sun. Now we'll move on to chapter 8, talking about Earth as a planet, and we do this very specifically because we want to do what's called comparative planetology. This is in comparing, comparing every other planet we have to the way the Earth is. So we must understand how Earth acts and reacts in science so that we can interpret the rest of the planets. So here's a very neat image taken from the uh, International Space Station in 2006. This is from a volcano spewing ash up in the space in the Aleutian Islands. Um, pretty neat stuff to see from space. Our blue marble, as we call it, taken from the Apollo 17 astronauts. Uh, a very rare image of the full Earth during the Apollo program taken. So what does the Earth look like inside that we believe? Well, due to the fact that the Earth has a magnetic structure to it, we believe that it's got a liquid 
core inside it. We have an outer core and an inner core. Inside of it, all of this is a mantle. So most of the earth is this plastic, rubbery type stuff called the mantle. And then the very thin outer layer, kind of like the skin of an apple, is the crust. And we've never driven drilled down into the mantle, but I believe there's a mission now getting ready to try to do so. Um, they're going to go to the bottom of the ocean where we can get more access to the mantle and drill into it. And as you go down into it, it gets hotter and hotter. So Earth's crust is determined from satellite images and ocean floor radio mapping. Oceans and lakes are shown in blue. The dark areas representing depth of the ocean. 75% of the Earth is ocean. Now, I said that the Earth has a magnetic field, and it does. It protects us from much of the solar wind that comes at us from the sun. Um, sometimes when the solar wind is pretty fast and pretty active, we can get bending of this magnetic field, and if it cracks, then we can get the solar wind to come spiraling around these magnetic field lines into the northern and southern poles, the magnetic poles of the Earth. And at that point, we get the aurora uh, borealis in the northern hemisphere, the aurora australis in the southern hemisphere of the northern lights, southern lights. We form igneous rocks out of lava. Lava cools and freezes. Here's a lava flow from a basaltic eruption. So lava rocks are basaltic. Basaltic lava flows can flow quickly and easily over distances over 20 kilometers. The Earth is not one solid chunk of rock. It's made up of plates. The North American plate makes up most of North America. However, you can see it's quite big. It does combine uh, over here with the Eastern Pacific Rise, the Pacific Plate, the Cocos Plate, the Goiter Plate. And so this is where we have the San Andreas Fault Line, where these two plates meet. And in fact, um, San Francisco is coming closer to LA and San Diego, and San Diego and LA moving up towards San Francisco. And someday the two will meet. So we, we always joke about Los Angeles sliding off into the Pacific Ocean. It's not really going to slide off. It's going to slide up to San Francisco. Now where I live in Missouri, we have the New Madras Fault, which has been quite active recently. It hasn't really erupted in over 200 years, and it's way overdue for an eruption. And this is not due to friction of the place, but the fact that the North American plate is so big that it's actually bending itself in the middle, much like if you held a large piece of paper or a big plane of glass, it bends in the middle when you hold it. Um, that's what's happening at New Madrid, and we haven't had a big quake since 1811-1812, and we are overdue for it. My city, Springfield, has been designated as the FEMA site for all the relief efforts when it does go off because places like Memphis is going to sink into sand. Memphis was built onto a sandy um, uh, landfill base. It's going to sink. FedEx already has plans in place that when the New Madrid fault line goes, its hub in Memphis will be gone, but they can be back up and running within 24 hours at other locations. Uh, St. Louis will be gone when this happens. The Mississippi River will flow northward instead of towards the Gulf of Mexico. And this was all proposed by Alfred Wagner in 1880-1930 was his life. He only lived to be 50 years old. Wagner proposed a scientific theory for the slow shifting of the continents. And here's what we find. 
rift, found, rift zone, excuse me, and subduction zone. A rift and subduction zones are the regions mostly beneath the oceans where new crust is formed and old crust is destroyed as part of the cycle of plate tectonics. We're going to have a transform where you have a plate going underneath another plate which forms an island arc. You can also have magma forming from below that comes up and separates the arcs. And that's where we get in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean is the separation of the plates moving North America and Africa farther away from each other at a rate of about two centimeters a year. And here we see the San Andreas Fault from the sky, a very active region in California. We know exactly where it's going because we've got GPS monitors all over the place on the San Andreas Fault. We have farmers who have uh, fences up along across the San Andreas Fault where you can greatly see how it's moved in the last number of decades. Of course we have mountains on Earth as the tours of the plains, a young region of Earth's crust where sharp mountain peaks are being sculpted by glaciers. And then we talk about the Earth's atmosphere. So we have several layers to the atmosphere. We have the troposphere, which is where all of our weather comes. We get, uh, this is where all the planes fly. This is 90% of our atmosphere is down here in the lower troposphere. It's like sitting on a bed, you squish the bed down, or you squish the pillow down, and that's kind of what's going on with the atmosphere. It's squishing all that air down to the troposphere. You get about above Mount Everest, and you start to get water clouds. Nitrous clouds, oxygen clouds, and then we get into the stratosphere where the temperature gets quite chilly, and we get ozone up here. Ozone is a variation of oxygen. Oxygen is O2, ozone is O3, three oxygen molecules. And then we go back up to the mesosphere where we find meteor showers coming in. We're at a height of 80 to 100 kilometers now, and then we go right back up, get hot again into the ionosphere, and this is where we find the northern lights. Of course, we can see storms from space. This was Hurricane Irene in 2011 that just battered New York City. The combination of Earth's tilted axis of rotation, moderately rapid rotation, and oceans of liquid water can lead to violent weather on our planet. And this is a computer generated image showing the frozen areas of the northern hemisphere during the past ice ages. From the vantage point of looking down on the North Pole, the areas in black indicate the most recent glaciation, coverage by glaciers. And the areas in the gray show the maximum level of gradation ever reached. We can find stromatolites in fossils. These are polished cross sections of a fossilized colony of stromatolites. Dated back to the Precambrian era, the layered dome like structures are mats of sediment trapped in shallow waters by large numbers of blue green bacteria that can photosynthesize. And these can date back to 3,000 years or more. Greenhouse effect. Well, we get radiation in from the sun. About 50% of the radiation from the sun stays at the Earth's surface. Most of the rest bounces back up into clouds. Clouds can then bounce back down to Earth, much like a car on a hot day. The radiation comes in comes to the glass, changes the infrared radiation. That infrared radiation can't escape out of the glass because it's two different wavelengths. Comes back down in and we save some of that, about 20-30%. But we do have 20-30% of that sunlight get bounced off of clouds, reflected light back out in space. How has carbon dioxide change throughout the years. This is a very critical graph to understanding climate change. Scientists expect that the amount of carbon dioxide 
will double in the pre-industrial level for the end of the 21st century. Measurements of the isotopic signatures of this added carbon dioxide demonstrate that it is mostly coming from burning fossil fuels. And we can see here that in recent years, excuse me, we have hit the 400 parts per million mark, and that was considered to be the point of no return. It oscillates up and down throughout the years, but you can see the great rise that's gone through even since 1960 up to current time. It's gotten down up to 400 parts per million. In fact, here in 2018, it's now standing at 408 parts per million. Here's an impact crater located in Algeria. We don't see a whole lot of impact craters on the Earth, but we do see some. In fact, there's a chain of impact craters, much like we saw in Jupiter, when the string of pearls, Shoemaker Levy 9, hit Jupiter. We have a string of craters that go along the Interstate I 44 from Tulsa to St. Louis. Sorry about that, dogs. So we have uh, this is the aftermath of the Tunguska explosion. That's taken 21 years after the blast. This was a either an asteroid or a comet that exploded above Russia in the Siberian desert, and it flattened out trees for hundreds of miles, caused fires in London. And then the most famous meteor crater in the world is the Barringer Meteor Crater in Arizona. 50,000 years old, made by a 40 meter lump of iron, about the size of a school bus. This thing is 630 feet deep, uh, three quarters of a mile wide. And you can see a little road here in a little white building. They have a little visitor center right there. You can. Uh, gaze into Meteor Crater. This is actually on a farmer's ranch and they just, instead of farming, they've turned this into their own family business, Barringers. The crater that knocked out the dinosaurs is called the Chicxulub Crater and is located in the Yucatan Peninsula down here. Um, we've mapped part of the ocean floor and found this brown area in the Yucatan Peninsula. There's a lot of marsh area down here and forest. And then the Chichilu Crater came down here and went around there. And we believe this is what knocked out the um, dinosaur 65 million years ago. And that's it for week four lecture.